Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, episode 151, BGA in review, and games that we resolve to finally play. We'd like to thank our Patreon backers for allowing us to bring you an ad-free episode. You're listening to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network, dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast of board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. And this is Anthony. Happy New Year, Anthony. Happy New Year indeed. 2018 is finally here. Could I think, not uh, get here any faster. That's exactly what I was about to say. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good year for games, though, if we're going to... We'll keep it positive for you guys. <laughs> sure. <laughs> it was a very good year for games. It was a very good year for conventions. It was a very, very good year for BGA. We just finished our episode 150. We've been around for quite some time, so much so that we actually had to go back and redo our top 100 list. So if you haven't gotten a chance to listen to that yet, jump back to episode 150. I think you're really going to love that episode. It's our top 100 games. And, of course, you can jump back all the way to episode 100 when we first did the list and see how things have changed. That's always a lot of fun for me, and hopefully it's a lot of fun for you. And it's kind of our currently our definitive list of the top 100 board games of all time with particular asterisks of games that we haven't gotten to the table or random events or conventions, but our top 100 games. And I really love that list. How about you, Anthony? Yeah, yeah. Way more Euros. Take it. (laughs) Deal with it, guys. That's what you know. What you're listening to. So. <laughs> you know your problem, well, man. You can't. You know what you came here for. <laughs> yeah, and I promise someday, Dave. Someday I'll play more dominant species so we can move it up the list. But for now, I've still only played it two thirds of once. So. <laughs> well, I'm sure Dave appreciates that, and he's been a good friend. He's been on the podcast before, and he, he helps supply a lot of our Euro games to the table. So we're we're looking we're looking to get that up there, Dave. Don't worry about that. So. As the year goes on, new games get added all the time, and maybe when we hit episode 200, we'll take a look at the list again, see if anything's changed. But for right now, we have a great list there, and if you go check out BoardGamersAnonymous.com, our official website with all tremendous content, articles, podcasts, pictures, everything you can want there, you will find a detailed review of all 100 games. So after you listen to the episode and you hear our comments about that, go to the website. There are new, different comments that really kind of flush out why those games made the list and why they particularly landed at those particular spots as Dominant Species did. But check that out. I think you'll really enjoy that. And please, if you have any comments, whether you like where certain games are or if games didn't make a particular spot on the list, check out Facebook. Always have our Question of the Week going on there. We have our Twitter site. Don't forget, you can rate us on iTunes and Stitcher. Of course, our Patreons allow us to bring you an ad-free episode. So if you'd like to be a Patreon and join everybody on our Slack group so you can have those conversations there, that's always open and available to you. And don't forget, we're always trying to bring new stuff to the table and new stuff to you, the audience. So more reviews on iTunes, more reviews on Stitcher allows us to give you more stuff. And we're looking forward to bringing more contests and just more outreach and more games to you. So rate us there, and we'll drop a game on your table pretty soon. You're going to talk about this in a little bit, but there was an announcement this last week that Scythe is getting a new campaign mode. So I asked everybody, what existing games do they want to see campaign-style expansions added to? Uh, I think 2017 was definitely the year of the legacy-style campaign, and story is big in games right now. So what other games can we add story to? Tim said Clank in Space. Um, and to be fair, there is an app for Clank that does some of this, but Clank in Space is not yet in the app. So I could see wanting to kind of add that one to the mix. We had a vote here from Michael for Robo Rally. Uh, he said they, him and his friends actually created some rules back in 2000, but he no longer has them, unfortunately. Uh, Willie says Terraforming Mars. And I can definitely see that. Graham and Aaron both mentioned Twilight Imperium 4. And I think I would definitely purchase that whether I I ever got it to the table. I can't even imagine a Twilight Imperium 4 campaign, how long that would be. Darren mentioned Voyages of Marco Polo. Somebody mentioned Blood Rage. We have Eon's End. 
And uh, Matt mentioned Dice Forge because while it would be very component heavy and full of power creep, the ability to save your dice and progressively add better and better sides throughout a campaign would be awesome, which I agree with. That would be pretty cool. Personally, I would love to see really any of my euros, you know, any of these big euros that have a ton of great content in them, but you, they kind of, they get, they don't get stale necessarily. It's a great game. There's a lot to unpack in them, but to be able to kind of progress and unlock new things and kind of tweak it a little bit, really just get like those module style expansions, but unlock and play with them as you go forward through the game. I think a lot of them would lend themselves to that pretty well. Any Rosenberg game, <laughs> I feel like you could do something cool with that. Sure. Uh, so Scythe definitely falls in that. So I'm excited to see what Jamie does with that one and how it would translate to other games. Yeah, I would have to say what's really been hitting my table a lot and something I've really been enjoying and been not tremendously surprised because it looks like a fantastic game would be Spirit Island. And mm, yeah. in part because it's such a thick and rich theme to the game, you are the spirits that are working with the native people to push off these invading colonists. And I would love to see a campaign-style mode for this game where you're talking about generations and generations of these spirits maybe dwindling in power, the native people still trying to fight back, and maybe even kind of like maybe a, almost like an American gods type of situation where different gods come in and then there's kind of maybe a little conflict amongst the gods as the colonists start to kind of entrench themselves and you are still trying to push people back. So that would be really interesting. I'd like to see an evolution of that game because it's so evocative when you play it. That would be amazing. And it's perfect too because all of these games that kind of add a campaign or come with one out of the box – tend to be cooperative. You know, mm -hmm. we've got Robinson Crusoe has Voyage of the Beagle and the upcoming Lost City of Z. First Martians comes with one out of the box, Gloomhaven. Um, you know, a lot of these games, they work really well because of that. So that would be pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Anthony, we already been talking about our favorite games, some games that we hope to get to the table soon. So what's your acquisition and disorder? All right, so the, the game that I'm really interested in is one that ac it released several months ago in Europe only, and I believe they only printed a thousand copies. So I don't have it, but Tasty Minstrel picked up the license to this. That's Gentes or Gentes. I'm not really sure how to pronounce it. Um, this is the newest game from Stefan Riesthaus, who is the designer of Arkwright, which is a fantastic, incredibly heavy game from Capstone Games and previously from Spielworks that I love but I almost never get to play because it is four to six hours long. This game is an hour to two hours long, and it is a card-driven civilization game, um, which has a pretty cool timing mechanism in it. And you're, you're basically taking on the role of an ancient people, and you're trying to develop and build monuments and colonize and found cities in the Mediterranean. So you know the deal. It's a civilization-style game, but it's kind of this streamlined, interesting, unique take on that mechanism you know in kind of a more heavy euro rather than the sprawling civilization style area control games that we're used to so this one is getting the deluxify tasty minstrel treatment on kickstarter this year i have not actually gotten a chance to play this yet in the original version i don't know anybody who got one and if you want to get one now they're very expensive but i will probably back this just based on what i've seen and having played arkwright uh, the several times that I have played it and loved it, uh, getting a slightly lighter game from the same designer in my favorite genre of game, the civilization games. I'm pretty excited about this one. Yeah, that looks great. And as you said, a lighter version, maybe to introduce new people into the heavier game. It's always hard to get someone to commit to a four to six hour game. But if you can get them to play a one to two hour game, they're more than likely to kind of sit down for the heavier stuff, especially if they like the first stuff. Yeah, that's a great point. This would be like a like a backdoor in, like, oh, you like this game? Here's his <laughs> other game. How long is that one? Don't worry about it. It's cool. It's cool. <laughs> There's a short version. We'll do the short version. How long is that? Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's getting very uncomfortable here. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Let's just like... play the game, guys. <laughs> All the cool kids are doing it, man. I'm telling you, you're going to like it. <laughs> the first play we is should... only an hour. <laughs> <laughs> we should definitely order dinner though we're gonna be here for a while <laughs> we're gonna be here for a while. everyone gets settled in <laughs> all right well we talked about this on our question of the week it was something that like i woke up i checked my phone 
and I saw that this was coming out, Scythe, The Rise of Fenris, and I was like, yes! And I actually knew at least generally that there was a third expansion coming out for Scythe, and Anthony and I talked about this. I'm like, you know, if you go to Stonemeyer Games' website, which is fantastic because he really walks you through, he's got a great little chart about where a game is in production and shipping. So this was sitting there, and Anthony was like, what? There's a third I'm like, yeah, I don't know. It's it's un, it's unnamed. It, it, maybe it's a mistake. It's I don't know why it's on here. He didn't announce anything yet. And here it is. So as we said before, we're looking at a eight-episode campaign, which is part of this expansion. And that's pretty amazing. And there is not a lot of information here, but there's going to be surprises. There's going to be unlockable elements and persistent events. And what's really great about this is it's fully resettable and replayable, which I guess maybe he got at least partially from Charterstone, which I really like to see. And then the second part is there's actually 11 modules that come with the game that you can play with instead of or after the campaign. And this is where the Rise of Fenris comes into play. And you can kind of mix and match and put these modules together. And it's fully compatible with the other expansions, which is great because I like my airships, so it's nice to have this. Now, the details about this is that there's going to be an episode guidebook, 13 plastic miniatures, which is very interesting because, I don't know, is that another race? Is that an NPC group? You know, I'm just speculating here. 62 wooden tokens, so maybe some new resources. Two custom dice, which is, okay, something different. Five tiles which I have no idea what that, that means because it's a board. It doesn't really have module play. And 100 plus cardboard tokens. So this is a really hefty expansion. This is an automatic buy. You know, when I first got Scythe, I was really excited and we got to the table and really enjoyed it. There was always something missing. I don't know if this expansion is going to do it. I don't know if the airships will do it because I haven't gotten that to the table yet. But I'm looking for something to to wrap Scythe up in the perfect bow that I always thought it was supposed to have. Yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously we like Scythe. It was our number two game yes. last week. But I'm I'm with you. Like the that first expansion with two new races, I'm like, great, this is cool, some flexibility, new mechanics. The most recent expansion, great, new end conditions, much, much needed, and the airships are awesome. But this is like and then everything else you've ever wanted for this game. Here you go. Sure. So I'm really, really excited to see what this does and how it changes the game and how it adjusts it and how it works with all the other stuff. What I find interesting, too, is there's no new cards or anything. So this is all sure. token and board driven. Yeah. Obviously, there will be spoilers and everything in here because, it's, you know, it's going to come out and it'll be a campaign based. We don't know anything about it ourselves. They just, you know, he just announced this a few days ago. Um, and the, the other funny thing I thought was I didn't know about this at first, but... We were in the Slack group um, for the Patreon backers, and I think Jason and I, maybe one other, one of the backers, one of the listeners, was we were talking about Charterstone, and they were like, "Oh, I just finished this. You know, what did you guys think?" And you just posted just uh, Scythe Fenris campaign. That was it. <laughs> like, there was no context, <laughs> and I was like, "Wait, Scythe campaign?" So I just like dumped that conversation, <laughs> and I started googling. I'm like, "Was he confused? Was that a typo?" <laughs> so. <laughs> Nobody else caught that. Just gonna Charter Stone is fine, but Scythe campaign, come on, guys. I'm just going to leave this here. <laughs> just walk yeah. out. <laughs> At least somebody got it. Yeah, I was I was off to the races with that. So very, very excited for this. Some very cool stuff in Charter Stone that even if he took some pieces of that and put it into this, I think it'll be really cool. Sure. I think we're getting to the point, and, and I think it's a great point as, as far as board gaming is concerned, where these publishers and designers have are doing such a fantastic job with the expansion and module based expansions aren't new. They've been around for quite some time, but I think we're getting to the point where we might have a situation where like a connoisseur is going to have to come out and be like, you know what the best way to play Scythe is if you play with this piece and you play this piece and you play with this expansion, but not that expansion because you're only going to get to the table so much and you may not get all the expansions so much, so maybe at some point there is the optimal version of Scythe that we'll see in the future. I I would imagine Jamie does that himself. Um, <laughs> he did it with Viticulture, right? Sure. And eventually, you know, he released Tuscany with 12 modules, and people are like, do I really need all this? And he's like, nah, here's an essential edition <laughs> with the three you need. So I could see that. I could see Scythe second edition where they just kind of streamline it down and say, here's the five things that I think are essential. 
you know, like they do with TI4 or any of those other games. But, but uh, yeah, at a certain point, how much stuff can you throw into one game? Sure. Well, make sure you get on to all of our social media and post about this because we now want a Scythe Essential Edition. Done. Yeah. <laughs> and Jamie, whenever... if you're listening, make it happen. <laughs> and when you do that, one of the great things about social media is by liking us, by following us, by doing all those things, and by posting those things at the social media, it gets to the designers, as Anthony has just shown, but also it allows those designers to kind of give us feedback and sometimes free games, which we will pass on to you. All right, Anthony, we've talked about all the acquisition disorders. I know there's a lot more, but let's get on to our at the table. So what do you have for us this week? Alrighty. I've been excited to talk about this one for a couple weeks, and I just haven't had a chance yet. This is Civilization A New Dawn. Civilization A New Dawn is the brand new IP-paced game from Fantasy Flight Games. Uh, it is based on the Civilization video game series, but this time based more on Civ Six than the previous games. So it has a little hexes and everything. But unlike Civilization, the board game, which is a four to six hour game with two decently meaty expansions and the full 4X experience, Civilization in New Dawn takes about 90 minutes. Now, most people, when they hear that, especially if they're 4X and Civ fans, are like, ugh, uh, you know, I want a big game. I want an epic experience. And I totally understand that because I agreed with that. Uh, and I wasn't even I was like on the fence with this game until we played just a quick demo at PAX. And that convinced me enough to go check it out and to pick it up. And I'm glad I did, because what you get in this box is a very well made distilled version of these bigger games. So the basic idea of the game is you have a focus bar in front of you with five different terrain types numbered one to five. And you're going to have five cards in front of them. Um, these cards are for science, which is going to upgrade your technology dial, for economy, which is going to let you move your caravans around and trade goods, for industry, which is going to let you build cities or wonders, your military, which lets you put out and fortify tokens and attack things, and then your culture, which lets you put out new control tokens. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to spread your influence. You put control tokens around cities, if you put control tokens on top of natural wonders or resources, you take those in and you can use those to buy wonders. You can also visit city states and convert them by attacking them or trade with them and get goods and special abilities. When you go up on the technology dial, you can upgrade the cards that are in your row. And on your turn, you're only doing one thing. You're activating one of those five cards. So you take the one action based on that card. Maybe the card's been upgraded, but it's going to be that one action. Then you slide that card down to the one slot, move everything up. All the cards become a little more powerful. And there you go. And that's your whole action. So it's very easy to learn, albeit with a few nuances on the board. There are three cards that come out at the beginning of the game that are your victory conditions. On each of these cards, there are two things. You have to do one of the two on each of the three cards. So you can't do two on one card and one on one of the other two. It has to be one on from each of the three cards. And the first person to do that that is the end round, and then you see who wins, tiebreaker being the wonders. There are barbarians that move around the board uh, based on a die roll every round. The wonders all give you special abilities. Um, some of them are pretty pretty awesome. Uh, you have a starting civilization, which has a special power and also influences the order in which you put those cards out to start. And overall, you know, they managed to jam just about everything you'd expect into this game. You know, there's a decent military component, albeit without the units on the map. There's a modular board with hexes. There's the trade elements, the culture element, the wonders, which you have to have, uh, the city building element. It's all there, and it's just boiled down into this like distilled essence of civilization and really feels like you're playing the game. Uh, and it manages to do it in 90 minutes to two hours. Every single time I play this game, it's been less than two hours, and we've always had at least one new player. So that alone makes this game a buy for me if you enjoy Civ games. Now, if you have a group and you can play the longer games, this one is not better than the longer games. Wow. So if we were going to make a top civilization board games list, this isn't like my number one civilization board game. The reason I love it and say pick it up is because you can actually play it. <laughs> so it's a strong game. I'm going to give it a very good rating. But I'm not going to compare it, say, to like Clash of Cultures or Nations or Through the Ages on the exact same level because it is a different type of game. It's designed to be played, you know, again, in less than two hours 
to be taught to people who are not, you know, heavy board gamers. This is maybe, you know, a three weight versus the four of some of those other ones. But all that said, really, really, really enjoy this game. And because they give you a little bit of everything in the box and just not very much of it, the expansion opportunity here is very ripe. Yeah, I want to see more victory conditions. I want to see more wonders. I want to see more civilizations. I want to see expanded, you know, map options. There's a lot of things they can expand here. It doesn't feel like there's not enough here, although I imagine if I play the game enough, eventually I'm going to get to that point. But yeah, Civilization New Dawn is it's really, really fun. The more I play it, the more I like it. And I'm just really happy to have a Civ game that I can get to the table every week if people are willing to play it with me. <laughs> well, that's really great to hear because, as you said, Civ has kind of been a great game, but it's been sitting on the shelf for quite some time. So beyond as far as like getting the to the table because it's shorter do you think it plays better with any particular group because there's some elements that are not as key in this game yeah i mean it's not it's not as hyper aggressive uh, as some civilization games i mean most civilization games do focus on the tech and the culture side of things more than the combat but the combat can hurt i mean and you feel like you have to do it sure in this game it's always there and you're always able to do it and everybody's kind of on equal footing there but really, the only reason you attack somebody is if it's going to fulfill one of your three victory conditions. And people know it's coming. So it's not like, I have a card in my hand, you don't know what I'm going to do, and oh, I'm attacking you. Sure. It's, yeah, you need that natural wonder that I have, so I know you're going to attack me, so I should fortify around it. Like, these are the kinds of things that you can see coming. Like, it's all, it's all open information on the board. And I think all of that makes it a much more accessible game for people who don't play those big games. You know, I've played with several people now who are not necessarily new gamers, but not heavy gamers at all. Mm -hmm. And they've all had a, a relatively easy time getting into this and understanding it and playing it. And people who like the video games have particularly liked this because it does have kind of that feel of putting your city out, growing, moving out, your troll tokens, sending out some of your caravans, trading with other people, getting hit by barbarians in the side of the head a couple times. I'm like, ah, oh, stupid barbarians. <laughs> it, it just, it's definitely boiled down. It's not as complex, but it's like the video game in that that game can be simple if you want it to be, or it can be very complex. This is along those lines. And so I think it's just when I saw that card mechanism on the focus bar, I in, I was instantly like, this is genius. <laughs> like, I love this. I want to see it in more games. In this game, it's very good. I feel like you could do even more with it, you know, down the road. But um, yeah, I'm very, very excited about this one. Excellent. Well, talking about games that are shorter and I guess better for a broader audience, a game that I got recently to the table is Kalimala. Now, this is a game from ADC Blackfire Entertainment from the designer Fabio Lapiano. And basically what we're looking at here is in the Middle Ages, cloth merchants in Florencia were very powerful and they were trading for foreign cloth with other merchants from other countries. And they became so rich and so powerful that they actually ruled Kalimala. So basically in this game, you are all about trading fabric and being able to make decisions politically as far as building up churches, building up power, and being able to grasp the largest amount of voting power so that you can basically have tiebreakers for a majority. Now, the game plays actually very simple. When you look at the board, it's your standard Euro fare, and it's actually a little more simplistic in some respects because it has a very small map in the corner. The game is kind of like split up into quarters, and you're looking at Europe, and you're looking at all these different trade paths. So it looks like you're standard trading in the Mediterranean type of situation. But basically, beyond this little map and beyond these churches and places of power that you're going to be able to drop off resources and add decorations to, the two areas to the left are pretty much the most dynamic, the most interesting, and why I really do love this game. First off, the top part of the board is going to get randomly assigned tiles that are going to show you which of the different areas on the board are going to score and in what order. So based upon that random order and how those tiles flip over, brick might score right off the bat. So you want to rush and you want to put brick out or maybe a certain port scores. So you want to get as much fabric to that port as possible. But everyone gets to see what scoring and what order. So there's no kind of like overly kind of like strategic hidden information. You know exactly what's scoring, what order those things are scoring in. And as the game goes on, 
you'll you'll be able to build towards those future scoring opportunities because all of that scoring happens right there and then with the exception of one kind of hidden victory point condition that you play at the very end of the game. So basically, you are fighting and scraping for those very small points each turn. And basically, each of those little tiles are going to score you either 3, 2, or 1 points. Now, this game plays from 3 to 5 players, so it's possible you could score something if you have something there. Or it's possible if you're playing with 5 players, you might not get anything at all. Now, actually, how do you accomplish those victory point conditions is the bottom left part of this board. Now, this is the really interesting part, and I don't think I've ever seen this in a Euro game. Basically, once again, you are going to take nine tiles that can be randomly assigned to these nine different spots. So you basically have a cube of these nine different spots. The middle spot is printed on the board, and that's basically allows you to put resources in one of the churches, but everything else is randomized. So you might have a spot with wood, you have a spot with trading, you have a spot with material, brick, uh, moving things versus via wagon to build something, marble, and to actually build decorations. So those things can kind of be randomly assigned. What you're going to do is you are going to send your people down to the streets to be able to activate those spots. So you have these little, these little discs, you place them on the street, and what they'll do is they'll activate two of these tiles. So basically you're hitting two of those available businesses. So maybe on that turn, you'll pick up marble and you'll also pick up an opportunity to build something. So that's kind of interesting because you get to do two things on that turn. And basically that's all you're doing. So once again, it's kind of slimmed down and very elegant in that way. Now here's the kind of fun part. If you get your disc there first, Another person can come along and place their disc on top because they want those same materials or same actions. Once they take their action, because you're below them, you're going to activate again and be able to take those resources or those actions. That's not it. It comes. It gets even a little better. A third person comes, it activates everybody below. And once again, you could actually go to that spot more than once, so you'd be activating yourself again. Now, when the fourth person, and, that, and yourself included, goes to that spot, the bottom disc moves over to the place where this, these political actions take place, and that disc goes the next victory tile and activates that scoring for that round. So not only are you getting resources and you're building and you're trading, but collectively you are deciding on what activates and scores at that particular moment. So you might find yourself in a situation where you're the only person with bricks in that church. So you might want to go activate that tile as quickly as possible so that scores. Or maybe you haven't gotten any material to that particular port, so you want to make sure to keep your discs away from that area so that it doesn't activate. This is really fun and interesting, and as you're activating these different victory point conditions, that shows that you have votes in this council so that you're able to break the tiebreaker if you have the most discs possible. Now, beyond all this, there is white discs that come into play that allows you to take an action twice, but basically that's it as far as the game is concerned. You're shipping goods, you're moving goods across the country, you are decorating these different churches, and in all, it's a surprisingly fun game with an interesting dynamic mechanic that I have not seen before. Now, this came out at Essen, and it's currently... I guess, up for possible distribution in the U.S. It's not here yet. Thanks, Dave, for actually bringing it to the table. But for Kalimala, this gets a solid buy if you can pick it up. If it's really too high and you're importing across the seas, maybe you want to wait a little bit because I think this game will get picked up. But this is a game that you can get people to play because it doesn't take a lot of teaching. All the information's out there for everybody. And it's a lot of fun, quick, fast playing Euro. That's great. I'm sad we missed the chance to play it at PAX. I know they had it set up there the whole time. Yeah, it's it's surprisingly easy to play. That's what's probably the most shocking thing about it. When you sit down to play Euro, you're like, well, I'm going to be in for a half hour of explanation. And I think in about five minutes, we were ready to go. That's great. Yeah, a lot of fun. <laughs> and that, I love games that yeah. have depth that you can uh, that you can learn quickly. Yeah, it's really tight, and I think this plays probably best at the higher player count. So definitely check this out. All right, so let's get to our feature review. 
All right, Anthony, let's take a look back at our most anticipated games for 2017 and how they fared over the year. So why don't you take us through that list? Yeah, for sure. So we did this way back in January 2017, and these were the games where we're like, these are coming out. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> so I think almost all of these did come out with two, maybe three exceptions. Sure. Not all of them were amazing, but we can run through them real quick. <laughs> At the top of the list, Charterstone. That was our big anticipated game of the year, and that did make it just before the end of the year mm -hmm. uh, in December. A chance, I have had a chance to play through it and uh, have not reviewed it yet because still want to get through a couple more things. But uh, and Chris has not played it, of course, so we don't want to spoil anything. Sure. But it's out. People are playing it. It's everywhere. So that that is a uh, it's, it's a big hit. Is, let's put it that way for purposes of not spoiling the game. I think the um, most interesting thing about Charterstone is trying to get a game group to play that, which I did do. And that was a game in and of itself. No kidding. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like I finally found a few people to, to get through a few games with. I don't know if we'll ever get around to finishing it because it's hard to get them together. At least sure. the game is short. So on the flip side of the board, I just ran through it solo and did all 12 because I wanted to know what happened. Sure. Pandemic Legacy Season 2, that one came out. I have my copy. I've not yet had a chance to play it. But this is another one where people are even saying, some people are even saying it's better than the first one, which I'm excited to see how. <laughs> but uh, that's a fun one. Rising Sun is not out yet. But this is the new Eric Lane game. It is shipping, I think, at the end of this month. Yep. So possibly that might even be a couple months early, which is dumbfounding for a Simon game. First Martians, Adventures on a Red Planet. This is the Robinson Crusoe in space from Ignacy Trevicek. Uh This one was decently disappointing, I think, for a lot of people. I actually rather enjoyed it. But it is rather than exploring and building, you are keeping things from breaking. And it's got that stark space feel to it. So I think a lot of people are disappointed in that, plus the whole rule book thing, which is a disaster. That's, you know, anytime the rule book is untenable, it makes the game hard to learn. But, so I, I think a lot of people were expecting that to be their top game of the year, and it was not. But it's still a decent game, in my opinion. Yamatai was the new Bruno Cathala game, and I quite enjoyed it. I feel like it kind of fizzled out and didn't really get a ton of buzz after it released last April. Did you ever get a chance to play this? I got a very quick play of it, but I haven't been able to sit down since. So it's, we talked about this earlier, the pol the new policies as far as pricing is concerned has really hurt Asmodee and especially Days of Wonder because I have not seen this at the table since. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I've, my game group is usually at least one or two other people with games that I have, and this is one where I'm the only one who has it. And so I bring it if someone requests it, and that's about it. I like it, but it's, yeah, it doesn't come out very much. Uh, the Dresden Files Cooperative Card Game. Now, this one burned hot for like a week or two around Gen Con, but it is a fairly decent, very short, accessible cooperative card game. It's not a deck builder. It's definitely a full-on co-op puzzle, um, but I rather enjoyed it uh, for people who like the Dresden Files books. I think that's probably the sole audience of this one a little game that some of you might have heard of called gloomhaven huh? gloomhaven am i saying that right gloomhaven are you talking uh, about the number one game on board game geek possibly maybe are we talking about the same gloomhaven or is it the other gloomhaven <laughs> um, so this one shipped to the original backers in february so i've had my copy since like the first week of february i have not played it nearly as much as i should have considering that but i've played it a decent amount and it is now the number one game on Board Game Geek. So there you go. I'm a trendsetter, guys. <laughs> Fugitive is the two-player card game from Tim Fowers and company. I haven't got a huge chance to play this, but I know you like it, right? I do quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at any time you get a quick two-player game and anything from Matt Fowers, you know, is going to be good. Yes. The Imperial Assault app, Legends of the Alliance, which is what we now know it's called, because back in January, this thing was vaporware. We didn't know it was going to exist at all. It was just like, please, please. But they did it. They pulled it off. It's out. I've played my Imperial Assault for the first time in two and a half years. So <laughs> that's all I needed, guys. <laughs> Justify these purchases. Brazil is a game from What's Your Game? Nuno Bizarro Sentiero and Paulo Soledade. It's not out yet. Uh, it got delayed several times. I think this was actually originally going to come out at Essen almost two years ago. And now it's going to come out on Kickstarter sometime this year. So we'll keep an eye on that. Hopefully, eventually we can play it. The Hospital Necked expansion, Ruhr Valley, uh, that one came out. And while I've Hospital Neck hasn't really sat super well with me, I actually passed my copy along to Chris. I felt like this expansion was a must 
must-have addition to the game. If you do like Hospital Nectar or close to liking it, this adds the variety and randomness to it that you kind of need the game to have. Dungeon Alliance, this was a Kickstarter from Andrew Parks. This one, I don't believe it's shipped quite yet, but it should soon. And it's kind of a unique take on uh, dungeon crawlers with kind of a Euro uh, spin on it. So excited to see how that one plays when it finally launches. Seventh Continent is another one of those kind of moonshot games like Gloomhaven where you're like, there's no way this is going to work. And then it worked so well, in fact, that they had a second Kickstarter and raised something like seven million dollars. So which same thing happened with Gloomhaven. I think his second Kickstarter was around four million. And so both of these on their first Kickstarters, by the way, were several hundred thousand. So they increased many, many fold um, once people actually got their hands on the game. Lisboa. This is one that dropped over the summer and we both got a chance to pick it up. Myself from Kickstarter, Chris from Origins. And it's fantastic. I mean, it's not my favorite Lacerda, but I know you've played a ton of it, right? Yeah, it's been a really surprising experience to get to this table so much. I thought that since it was such a long game and such a complex game that I would just, you know, wistfully look at it on the shelf. But it actually has gotten a lot of table time. And a lot of people have liked it, so I'm really happy with it. Yeah, for sure. Dice Forge is another one uh, from Asmodee, or from the Asmodee group at least, that I think got hit by their price issues. Same yep. as Yamatai. This game is great. It is a nice entry-level, gateway to mid-level game. You are building dice, and it works, unlike some other dice builder games in the past. It's a lot of fun, very, very basic, accessible, and incredibly beautiful game. And I've not seen it on the table in like five months so yeah i remember un- seeing this on board game geek everyone was really excited it looked absolutely beautiful an amazing insert and i have not seen it anywhere and i do not know anyone who has it so it's really sad about that yeah i like it i like it a lot it's it was kind of one of those nice little surprises over the summer and then it just disappeared completely yeah. which is unfortunate And then the last one here was the Rune Wars miniature game. So this was not quite out yet when we did this list. And it launched in the spring. And there's no way to know how well it's done. Not well. Not well. Um, (laughs) And you know it's not done incredibly well because Fantasy Flight is launching another miniature game next month (laughs) called Star Wars (laughs) Legion. So, uh, And now there's plenty of people who don't like Star Wars and would prefer fantasy. But... Anytime a company starts immediately cannibalizing their own audience. Sure. I Again, we could be wrong and this game's doing great and we just don't know anybody who's picked it up. But I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so either. No. <laughs> and I feel bad uh, because you and I both love the Terranoff universe. We love Rune Wars. We're big fans of Rune Wars, the game, Battle Lore. And when this came out, we we're like, eh, all right. And, and then obviously Star Wars is now here and. They have a new baby brother, and they don't love you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it's a shame, too, because I liked the the approach to Rune Wars miniature game, like the way they did the units and the way they kind of moved. Sure. Um, it's unique to miniatures games, and it looks like the Star Wars miniatures game is going to be a little more traditional yeah. in, t- in how that works. And I won't care because it's Star Wars miniatures, so I'm just going to buy it anyways. But like the actual gameplay, I might have preferred Rune Wars. But when you've got then a Game of Thrones coming out after that from Simon and then Star Wars, I'm like, sorry, guys, I don't care about Terranoth that much. That's and, unfortunate. And this is one of the games where you need a crowd of people to buy into a lot of expensive stuff and be available to play it. And that's just not going to happen because, as you said, there's not a lot of people who are into the more heavy miniatures games, at least at this specific level, Not because there are serious miniature gamers this is not what we're talking about here so over the battle of the dollar game of thrones and star wars are going to just eat up a lot of that out there oh for sure yeah all right so those are the games that we were highly anticipating for 2017 and basically how they broke more or less so anthony now that we're looking at 2018 let's take a look at our resolutions for the upcoming year and you know something that uh people can hold us on and eventually hold over our head and you know come back and be like hey you know uh remember you said you were gonna do x well it's 2019 what uh, what happened with that so what is your (laughs) uh what's your first resolution here for 2018 what what are you talking about as far as getting a game to the table i i think it has to be star wars rebellion i have probably 40 plus unplayed games in some form or another 
maybe some of those are expansions, but Star Wars Rebellion is the biggest glaring, oh my god, how have I not played this game on my shelf right now? Sure. Now that I've knocked off TI4. Yeah, you have, you have no excuse now. <laughs> yeah, this is the big one. And so uh, Star Wars Rebellion, if I have to kidnap a, another Star Wars fan and bring them to my house and be like, we're playing this game, I'm going to make it happen sometime this year. Well, to be fair, you're not a big Star Wars fan, so. You know. No, not at all. No, no. I, I don't. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't not sleep the night before a new movie or <laughs> have dozens of Star Wars toys in my, I mean, action figure, I mean, collectibles in my office. <laughs> okay. Well, the game that I've been wanting to get to the table, and as you said, because it's a little heavier, is Democker. This was a game that actually came up for auction at the World Board Gaming Championship. And once again, our good friend Dave came through. And I uh, was able to pick up a copy and a beautiful edition of the game, Unpunched, which is extremely wow. rare for this game that was out of print for quite some time and is, I think, universally agreed upon as being one of the heaviest, if not the heaviest, Euro games ever made and one of the highest quality games ever made. But because it's so heavy and because it takes so long, it has not gotten to the table and I have not even taken a look at the rules yet because I'm kind of taken back by it but once again i I think i'll go back to your comment anthony i play ti4 man right and and people were like no don't do that that's way too heavy way too long and that was not that it didn't feel long and those rules were not that heavy so d mocker man bring it on so that's what's gonna (laughs) happen in 2018 yeah man i i would love to i wish i was closer i I know so let's talk a little bit about just in general, our gaming collection and uh, what we're looking to do with that. So you have any resolutions as far as that's concerned? Yeah. I mean, like I said, I mentioned I have a couple, three dozen games that I have yet to play on my list, uh, you know, whether it's expansions, second editions, new games, whatever it is that I've picked up over the last couple years and they've sat there mocking me. So I want to get that unplayed list down to less than 10% of my collection. I don't know exactly what that number is, but it's a lot of games I need to learn and play, plus whatever else comes out this year. So really, whether that means tamping down on purchases or not, it's uh, not having so many unplayed games that like something so good like Rebellion just sitting there staring at me. Sure. For me, and this kind of popped up recently as I was plugging in my new games into my board game geek list board game geek gave me a micro badge for having so many games <laughs> so i was like Ugh. <laughs> like yes all right all right i need to take a look at it and recently i picked up some kalex so if you know what that means those are the ikea storage solution for, not for board games but they work damn good so i put together two four by fours and i still have two more two by fours to put together and the games won't all fit in there. So I'm looking to, I guess, begrudgingly find a way to trade away, give away, sell off part of my collection because I just unfortunately don't have space for it. And I really have to whittle down because, you know, game nights are hard to, you know, have every once in a while. And the number of games you get to the table are less and less. So I want to put together a a truly refined list and I definitely recommend everyone doing the same because sometimes you have to get rid of the chaff. So, all right, Anthony. So let's talk about your favorite convention this year. What what really kind of blew you away? Uh, yeah. So I mean, we went to a lot of cons this year. By far the most I've ever been to, four or five. And I think the one that I was most surprised to have enjoyed as much as I did was PAX Unplugged. And not because it was a bad con or anything. There were certainly a lot of issues, and the games we were hoping would be there weren't there. But the size of the con, the nature of the con, I got to play a ton of games. And because it was relatively local, there was a lot of people there that we knew. We hung out with a lot of friends. I got to meet Jason for the first time. Uh, he's from Connecticut. And I'm in Pittsburgh. So we kind of met in the middle. Uh, and it's it was like the most social con for me of the year by far. Sure. And so I think the number of games I played there outpaced all three other cons combined so I, I definitely look forward to that again next year that first look area with the Essen games were was outstanding I oh really, my gosh yeah it was incredible so uh, thanks for PAX they did a great job and looking forward to 2018 for me it was Gen Con 50 you know we've enjoyed Gen Con and basically Gen Con more or less is a trade show there is some gaming but it's basically a trade show with just endless numbers of games and publishers and designers. And it's 
pretty much like nothing else. And having been to Gen Con for the last couple of years, I was like, well, you know, number 50 is going to be nice. They're going to put together a nice new logo. But they really went out of their way. I mean, first off, history making numbers as far as the number of the people who showed up. History making as far as it was their 50th. So they had a, a, an incredible, amazing display of the history of Gen Con and the history of gaming, the history of D&D. And to see these... I want to say relics, but basically seeing all of these original RPG books and these original board games and how everything got started and seeing these original programs was amazing. And I and I guess finally, having that history, having those wonderful pieces to look at and to experience in the football stadium <laughs> was just like, it was surreal. I mean, walking through the stadium, walking on the field was just something that I never thought I would ever do as far as board gaming is concerned. And it just goes to show how far board gaming has come. My gosh, that was so cool. I, we didn't even believe they did it. We saw the map. We were like, it's on the field? Nah, yeah. maybe it's under the field. Maybe they have space under the field. <laughs> like, nope, no, it's right in the middle, smack dab of the stadium. Yeah, and you could play board games right there on the field. And it was just... It was a, it was truly a surreal experience and something I won't forget. So that's my top con. <laughs> so Anthony, any big surprises for this year, 2017? Yes, yes. I was thinking about this and I was like, oh, maybe this, you know, this game being good or this game being bad. And there's a lot of that stuff. But I think the thing that really surprised me was that my top five games, three of them are cooperative and or adventure games. So wow. And that's not me. That's not the kind of games I typically enjoy the most. I like the Euros. I like the heavy stuff. You look at our top 100 list, and that's pretty representative of both of us. But it's the year of Gloomhaven. It was the year of Spirit Island. First Martians was up there. Maybe not my top five, but it was up there for me. I played that a lot. I was just, I'm like, where did all these games come from? And are these the kind of games I play now? What's happening to me? (laughs) Um, It's just, I think, the quality and the attention to heavier gamers who demand more from their mechanics, I think, is what we're seeing here. These aren't just the same roll and move and fight games that we've had for the last 15 years, like Descent Clones. These are new new ideas being implemented in games like Gloomhaven, where you're solving a puzzle with the cards in front of you. Or Spirit Island, where every spirit is so very different and you have to manipulate the board and keep track of everything. And it's just this heavy, heavy game and experience. And I love it. And I'm I'm starting to understand why people like these co-op and adventure games. They just need to be done in a way that my Eurocentric mind can handle. You know, it needs to be interesting and exciting for me. Sure. I think for me, the evolution of getting games to the table really has stood out. You know, you can love a game as much as possible, but if it just doesn't get any table time, it really kind of fades away. So on one end, you know, the, the true experimentation of what actually gets to the table and how often gets to the table is, as you said, often surprising and, and typically not the games you think that would get there. For me, <laughs> one of the games I never thought that, this, <laughs> that I would get completely burnt out on is Concordia. It just became the default game for my gaming group, and I'm not really sure why that happened or how that happened, but typically if there is a break in the conversation as far as what game we should be playing, Concordia is always the answer, maybe because of its multiple mats or the fact that everyone enjoys this great game, but I'm honestly burnt out on it, and basically so is my game group. So this has been the first game that we've truly loved and been burnt out on. I mean... Every once in a while you play a game, you're like, well, that was fine, but let's never play that again. But a game that you truly love and get burnt out on, Concordia. Okay, so that is our BGA in review and games that we hope to play for the upcoming year. Feel free to keep us honest on this upcoming collection. Okay, until next time, this is Chris. And this is Anthony. And we'll save you a seat at our 2018 board gaming table.